It's good to see all of you. Welcome. You have made it to the TOC Open Meeting at KubeCon. I am Amy Scavarda Perrin, Director of Developer Programs, standing in for Chris Anacek. And it's lovely to be able to see all of you. We're here to be able to talk about TOC, and I'll let them introduce themselves. The Technical Oversight Committee. Emily, kick us off. I'm Emily Fox. I'm the chair of the TOC. I'm Kathy Zhao. I'm the TOC member. Uh, Ricardo, also a TOC member. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Katie Gamanji, uh, TOC liaison for Optech Delivery, as well working for Apple in my other part time job. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nikita Raghunath. I was newly elected to the TOC like two months ago, maybe, so I'm still very new at this. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I, my day job is at VMware. I'm also a Kubernetes maintainer, and I am a liaison for tag runtime and tag storage. I'm Richie. He's also a TC member. Yes. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> he's here on purpose. So um, what I'll do is I'll kind of give a quick overview of how this all works. Um, and as I do this, feel free to be able to put up hands, to be able to tell us, like, you know, anything you want us to be able to cover, I'm happy to be able to pause and do that. But as we get started, um, how many of you, this is your first time at KubeCon? Okay. All right. Um, and for those who have been here before, how many of you was this your first time at a TOC meeting? All right, so we're gonna start from the top then. You've seen all of these lovely people. There are a few more that haven't been able to join us today. Don't worry, the slides are online, it's fine. Oh. <laughs> and all of these people are all volunteers. They are elected by the communities and various different groups and they all come from the community as well. So they have deep, background as engineers and security research and people working in the community with the projects. And in order to be able to talk about that, I kind of have to talk a little bit about structure here. So we kind of have three different areas within the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We've got a governing board that then has a marketing committee underneath, the technical oversight committee, which really kind of oversees projects. Um, then focuses on being able to build out technical advisory groups. I'll get to that next, but these are kind of our top 11 technical folks as far as being able to engage with projects. They help admit new projects. They help move projects around levels. Um, we'll talk a lot about all the work that they get to be able to do day to day. And sometimes they work with uh, kind of other initiatives within CNCF. Uh, the way that people are elected are they're coming from governing board and user and developer kind of communities and happy to be able to go into that further, but that's kind of the important part. And on the side, we've got kind of the end user community, which also comes in to play and brings out other initiatives as well. So, talking about tags, tags are our technical advisory groups. Um, this group also gets to be able to work with those technical advisory groups, you don't have to be a member of like a company, you can just come and participate in those groups. And these are our tags. We have storage, security, app delivery, network, runtime, contributor strategy, observability, and environmental sustainability. So, that's kind of where we're getting started. Other piece before we get into this, we have three different levels of projects in CNCF. You've seen some of our graduated projects, our incubating projects, and our sandbox projects. And we can talk about what all of that means as well. So I'm now going to kind of come back in here and kind of kick us off about you as TOC members. What do you wish the community knew about your role and how this all works? And Richie, because the mic is closest to you, I'll start with you. Which door, people? No. <laughs> Uh, how much? Well, energy? actually, let me pause and kind of like set some of the stage here. As we, because not everyone that's watching the recording is going to be able to see that show of hands that we did in the beginning. And roughly half the room was their very first time at a KubeCon, and maybe like 15% that's their very first time at a technical oversight meeting. Yep. So. Maybe 30% for the, yep, for the <laughs> uh, Maybe how much? Thankless, tedious work this actually is. It's not very glamorous. You're putting a great it's... spin on it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. 
uh, just I can probably just some context about like what we yes. uh, so CNCF has a ton of projects and if you attended uh, Ricardo and my keynote in the morning you're probably familiar that we have like I think 150 plus projects mm -hmm. in the CNCF landscape and it can be very confusing there's so many projects it's just a little too much um, and the TOC is responsible for, uh, so like Amy said, the sandbox incubating and graduated projects. And the TOC is responsible for deciding which projects get into the CNCF and how they move between levels. So our job is to do due diligence on all of these projects when they get inside the CNCF sandbox and also like when they move between levels. And the due diligence uh, work, like it's a lot of work, definitely. Uh, we also talk to uh, adopters of all of these projects, like we do adopter interviews during the due diligence uh, process itself. Uh, there's also like the health of all of these sandbox projects. We do sandbox annual reviews. Uh, we can actually talk a lot about annual reviews yeah. and the work that we're doing currently. Uh, and just like any escalations that come up between like among all of these projects is also something we handle. So there's just, like a lot of things going on and um, just a lot. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very great encapsulation of uh, the overall workload we have to go through uh, as the TOCs. Uh, I think we are at a stage where I think everyone here is aware that we are a very scaling, growing community. Mm -hmm. um, and this means that we actually need to put processes in place to be able to sustain that growth. Um, everyone is familiar with the landscape. I think it's shown as, as a meme most of the time. Uh, it's shown to oh, kind of highlight the size and complexity of our landscape. However, for the TOC, this uh, actually means that we are one of the fastest growing open source communities out there and we need to put in place all of these processes and to evolve these processes accordingly. Um, so I think uh, we are, as a community, we are at the stage, if you think about Kubernetes, because I presume most of us are familiar, we are at the phase where we need to introduce HPA, horizontal part of the scaling, vertical part of the scaler cluster, like we are the scaling phase. And this is where we need to do that, not for containers, but for people and processes. All right, so I will add uh, um, another view, which is if you would ask me what I would like people to know about the TOC that I didn't know at the start, I would say that how rewarding it can be. It's true that it can be quite a bit of work, but actually you get exposed to a lot of different areas that are very far from your day job. Uh, probably, uh, because uh, there's so much diversity in the in the landscape. Uh, maybe you are focusing more on storage or more on uh, run times, but you end up working with uh, a lot of different projects. Not only the projects, but also the end users. As Nikita was explaining, uh, the due diligence involves a lot of contact with the end users to understand how the projects are used. All of this is extremely re rewarding. It will, like, broaden your view of the the whole uh, mm -hmm. landscape and the experience as well. Yeah, I think they already summarized very well what we do. I think uh, I would like to add that is um, we also, um, if we see in the process or in the criteria of, you know, a party moving level is not clear. I think, you know, we're working on that to make it more clear and, uh, and also consistent so that, you know, people think, you know, uh, when we evaluate the project or approve a project to move from one level to another level, is kind of like objective. Mm. And the last thing I'll add on to that is, uh, I wish everyone knew that the TOC is more than just a lot of work. And it's also more than just a lot of rewards. It's also about striking a good balance. A lot of the things that we do is not going to satisfy everybody's needs. It's not gonna make everybody happy, but we're trying to do what's in the best interest of our projects, of our community members, and to the adopters of these projects which means we have to consider a lot of different factors. We also need to design our processes for the most common lower denominator, meaning what's going to work for the most amount of projects and where can we have subjectivity that makes sense for them because not every project is the same. Their maturity and their growth life cycles and how they do development and releases is going to be very different. And that's going to be even more different depending on the technical domain that they fall within. Security projects don't necessarily look like app delivery projects. So it's all very different and we have to weigh all of these considerations together when projects are moving levels. All right. Happy to take questions from the room. I'm happy to make up questions too. Yeah, go ahead. 
So, hello. First of all, thank you very much for holding this uh, public session of the TOC. Um, I was wondering, could you like zoom in a little bit on this balance? Because I get a bit of a mixed feelings here at KubeCon. On one hand, we are all very happy here, and it's a community, and we're friends, and so on. And then you go to the sponsor booth, and you notice that, well, not everybody's friends here, or not at the same level. <laughs> and I assume that this must be putting a horrible pressure on the technical oversight committee, right? I mean, there might be money on the table, investments waiting, which are, quote, blocked potentially by you promoting a project. How do you, what are your thoughts around this, and how have, have you felt this, this kind of constant <laughs> challenge to, um, between community and still making businesses work? That is an excellent question and something I that, couldn't have made that up. That was yeah, wonderful. Thank like you. You started us off with the spiciest topic of the day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually something that we're currently working on and still trying to solve. Um, there is a lot of companies and invested individuals behind a lot of our open source projects, but not all of them. So let's be clear about that. Um, and many of them are very interested in seeking graduation, getting to that point, because that is a huge milestone for them. They've grown, it's, it's basically like releasing a brand new car in some cases, because you've put in the hard work, you've put it out there in the community, and somebody has said, this is a fantastic thing, it's mature, it's stable, it's working. And you wanna get there as fast as you can. But you can't just run head first into that wall. First you gotta learn how to crawl, and then walk, and then run, and that, that's really important, and for us, we're trying to see what those stages are with the existing projects that we have and figure out what works and what's not working. So right now we're seeing a lot of stuff that's not working as we originally intended or as was designed as part of the ecosystem. And we need to be able to pivot and change because projects needs eight years ago in CNCF when it came in are not the same as project needs today. And they're not the same as adopter needs from then to now. So that, that's where the balance is, and we're trying to figure out how to stand on either side of that balance beam and make sure we don't fall off. The only thing I would add to what Emily said is that uh, I think that's one of the good things of having also a diverse uh, set of members in the TOC, is that what you describe is um, um, mostly about projects, but actually some of the members of the TOC come from end users, uh, not necessarily from projects. And this gives us different views to kind of uh, balance, like you said, the, the, the interests of both the adopters and the end users. From the other side, of course, the project, uh, because there's a lot of things involved. But uh, this diversity really helps with, uh, with, with getting this balance. I actually walked us back in the slides to be able to highlight this, because the, the Technical Oversight Committee is actually composed of like a bunch of different people like pulled from these groups. I think maybe to highlight the, the message here is about setting the expectations right because we have a bunch of projects that would really like to have big announcements around KipCon and they would like to showcase the, the latest work, which is great. We, we're not against that. The only thing is they come to us, all of us, uh, with all of these due diligence process that we need to do just before KipCon or just like two months or three months before KipCon, which is completely unattainable for us to do. And going back to the point that we want to set the right expectations and to actually perhaps take some of the pressure from the TOC to deal with a lot of work like in, in a spike kind of level. It's not something that's consistently done. It's something yeah. that we need to spike around. We want that to be distributed around our work time because we are here volunteers work. Well, it's, it's not work. It's like we're doing this in a way part time, uh, but we need to do this consistently to not burn out because we still have full time jobs. So going back to the point of setting the expectations, right? Um, I think what we've done, we actually introduced uh, the notion of a freezing period before KubeCon, so the TOCs will not be able to vote for a project. And this is actually helpful for us because um, it, it does set the expectation rise for the projects, but at the same time it does make sure that we have a very un kind of uniform and consistent workload in between KubeCons, not just before KubeCons. And I'd echo that. It, it definitely is a work in progress. We, we are constantly trying to iterate and change how we're actually like basically participating with community, so. All right, other questions from the room? Yes, here, we'll, we'll give you a mic. And you can come to the, the center as well, that's fine. Hey, so for those of us who are in the backlog of projects that you're evaluating and working on, mm -hmm. uh, it can often be difficult for us to see progress 
uh, you know, you guys may be hard at work or you may be looking at something entirely differently. We just don't have a lot of visibility into that. So how can we stay informed as to the progress without absolutely drowning you in status update requests? <laughs> So very, very quickly, I think the, the easiest one is public TOC meetings. I think this is where we get the latest updates. Mm -hmm. We actually try to improve our transparency in the processes on GitHub. We try to move a lot of conversations there so we don't have to wait for a meeting once a month. We can do them async as much as possible. So GitHub for uh, the TOC, the TOC GitHub, uh, public meeting, and then we have the mail request as well. So I think these are the three ones I would recommend. We also have a TOC channel in Slack. And I would also add on to that that we're aware <laughs> that you all would like to get better transparency into where you're at. We're trying to institute some smaller initial changes, at least to convey where projects are at in, a, in an evaluation if we're reviewing you um, or if there is a backlog. We're trying to like get everybody organized um, so that you know where you're at in the process or when you're coming up. It's not ideal right now. We are trying to look at different ways of increasing that transparency doing things more in like an open source project kind of style, maybe mm -hmm. leveraging our project boards a little bit more accurately, because I don't think that we use them quite as well as we could be. Mm -hmm. We started that with sandbox projects, so you'll see those changes. We do have a project board for that. We'll probably do a little bit better there. But we're, we're trying to figure a lot of these things out. It's, it's a lot of work in addition to just doing the moving levels and the due diligence associated with projects. Yeah, and actually that brings me towards one of the good slides here. Um, so. We have regular meetings. We have meetings on the first and the third Tuesdays. And one of the things that we've implemented, and I will absolutely pass to Nikita in a moment, um, we've started implementing being able to say each TOC member goes through the projects that currently are on deck and we give updates at, at those meetings as well. Um, so that the community does know where things are moving. And yes, that's once every two weeks, but that's once every two weeks. Nikita. Yeah, just want to add on like the kind of actions that we're taking because we're also aware of this. Um, so for projects that want to move between levels, we hear the frustration and TAC contributor strategy is also actually uh, helping us to collect community feedbacks from maintainers and community members. So they're spinning up a short term group uh, to do this and they're looking for like leaders who can step in to lead initiatives like this. But this is absolutely going to happen and we're looking to collect feedback in a more structured and organized manner as well. Great question. Thank you. So we're looking forward yes, for your feedback as part of that <laughs> work stream as well. Anything else? We're good? Okay. Oh, okay. We, we have a mic, we're running around. We're happy to be able to take questions. <laughs> it's for the recording. Okay. So what's the difference and what does it mean from founding perspective to be part of incubating project or sandbox projects from the founding? Why would I come with my projects and my contribution to this? What, what, what resources I can have? So um, everyone joins at sandbox level, and at sandbox level you basically, uh, A, uh, you're part of the CNCF, so you can say that you're part of the CNCF. You also at this point have to transfer all copyrights and everything at the GitHub organization, everything to CNCF. So there is a stewardship and you can't just pull it back out again. So we have a certainty of, uh, of continuity of the thing. But you don't get much else, so you don't get any, any marketing support or any other major support at that phase. And this is by design because a lot of or most of the projects are in the sandbox phase and a lot of them will also probably stay in the sandbox phase for the entirety of their lifetime. At incubation and at graduation, uh, you actually start getting marketing support, you start getting more resources from CNCF, you start getting, for example, a maintainers update during KubeCon where you can talk about the project. Uh, this time during the keynotes, we had um, the graduated projects giving five minutes updates on their recent progress. So basically, you just get more and more support as you progress. The other thing which uh, this does, it signals to the end users that the TUC and the wider CNCF community looked at those projects and they actually gave them a certain stamp of approval, in particular once you're graduated or once you have used a graduated project or the project you use is graduated, that's the right term you know that they did cross the chasm and you know that this project is very unlikely to just go away. It's going to be stable and you can use it for production and you don't have to have too much concern about what's happening within the project, within reason. Yeah, 
so for sandbox party, you can think of it as a very starting stage. So that's you know um, the stage you start to build the community to have you know more diverse community, right? Um, for incubating, it's more mature. Uh, you probably you will have some you know not just as you know more diverse community with different people from different companies, right? And also some end user adoption. For graduating, it's more mature. So we have the criteria that, that listed, you know, the different uh, the projects in different stages with the criteria. Yeah. I think marketing support, that's a very important point. The sandbox is like, you think about it, it's not like, maybe I can say it's not very officially um, kind of. Um, the the sandbox projects are really like we, we we think of them as like good experimental things to be like trying yeah. on like the it might work it might not we're not totally sure but we think it's an interesting direction to kind of like look down and and kind of like follow that road down if it doesn't work out okay that's fine there's there's not a lot of attachment to that yeah there's a follow up question pausing for follow up go ahead so I think. In the sandbox, it's, you're offering like a protection from outside, since you said copyrights and open, um, uh, co like an organi organizational point of view. If I reframe it, it's more about this project is going to be here in some form. It's protected in its space, like it's it, it's protected in its little like snow globe sort of thing. You're allowed to be able to build out more, but it's going to be here at least okay. for a bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Can I, I think, yeah, I think it's going to pass around the mic uh, a bit. Um, I think going back to the reason why you should be CNCF, um, the thing is open source is very difficult and challenging to accomplish. And CNCF uh, is one of the ways to get a platform of support for your project. And this means that, first of all, you have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, first of all, you have all of the tags that will be able to provide guidance and support and resources for your project to mature, because ideally we all want the projects to be successful and to reach the next maturity level. But at the same time, um, it's it's up to the, the sandbox to get all of that kind of work and outreach to the tags and work with the feedback and implement that and slowly grow. Um, as well, from the end user perspective, it does bring some sort of confidence as well that this project is within the foundation and there is like some projection for the project to an, an, an evolution. Um, so I, I think it's not necessarily, yes, you have to use this project necessarily, but there is a level of confidence that's built around that. I just want to add a quick point that it also provides a vendor neutral space for contributors to work on the project. Like there are a lot of projects which are on GitHub, which are open sourced, but then uh, like Katie mentioned, like end users might sometimes not be confident to, to use it because they're like, eh, it's like, single vendor driven, maybe it's driven by a single company, but if it's in the CNCF, uh, they can be confident that it's a vendor neutral space and other companies would also be interested in contributing and collaborating on it. So I want to just highlight real quick here that not every project in open source needs to be cloud native. Um, that's kind of important. The whole point of the CNCF is to make cloud native ubiquitous, and that's something that we're really trying to do. However, we also understand that not every technology fits into a cloud native model. Um, that means when we're reviewing projects, both at Sandbox and at other phases of their life cycle, we're trying to figure out whether or not they're still headed in that direction. Are they still cloud native? Are they still applying our values and our principles? when we're looking at them, when they're engaging with their community, when they're designing their projects and building their architectures to ensure that their project is going to meet the needs of the use case that their potential adopters are going to be looking for. And if a project comes to us and they're not cloud native, we'll tell them and we'll probably recommend an appropriate foundation for them to belong. But one of the nice things about cloud native is it is actually extending outside of our ecosystem. We're starting to see more projects that are interested in reaching deeper into the uh, infrastructure stack, down into the networking layer, understanding what's going on within the kernel, as well as all the way back up to the application layer that doesn't really apply in cloud native, but it is a user level kind of experience. And we wanna ensure that we're considering all of those areas when we're looking at projects. So some decisions that we make in the past about whether or not to accept or reject a project might change as we continue to move forward. Yes, question from the room. Come on in. 
You talked about shifting conversations to GitHub and the, I really appreciate that written culture and it, it adds an, an element of both asynchronous and accessibility um, and inclusion. I was curious if you've considered, and I know from the few of you that I know up there, you represent at least three different continents and this is fairly impossible, but when you're not asynchronous, high bandwidth conversations are super useful, but have you thought about having varied meeting times? Like you've got two meetings, they're both at 8 a.m. Pacific. I'm gonna say that most of us joined the TOC when that time was fixed. Yes. So it's not something that we've ever thought of. It doesn't mean that we couldn't, it's mostly because, uh, yeah, that but one, um, uh, the people in front of you represent a very busy group in ways that their calendar doesn't always like allow for space to be able to change things. What I think I hear more in that is not so much being able to do um, varied meeting times, it's how can you expand the high bandwidth conversations into something that's more accessible. So. Uh, we do make sure that all of the public meetings are put onto uh, YouTube, so there is a, a recorded um, video to be able to come and participate. But I am thinking about how can we make more of the information that we have here more available and accessible. So even though I don't necessarily say, yes, more meetings, more meetings is the answer, I'd love to be able to hear more feedback from the community on what else we can do beyond moving more to a written culture of communication, which um, I think is one of the threads running through this. We, we understand that in order to be able to scale even further, we're going to have to change some of the processes that we've been really reliant on. We've been reliant on a meeting culture and moving forward, I think we need to rely more on a process and a, a more automation driven. So expect to see more project boards, expect to see more bite size updates of where pieces are moving. What did I miss? <laughs> okay. <laughs> One curiosity, which is there's also good things about this, which is, for example, when we have to reach out to end users during due diligence, we can easily spread the load across where the end users are located. That helps quite a bit instead of having to have like crazy time meetings because of where the users are located, we can actually spread between ourselves according to locality. So that's one of the good things uh, of being distributed. Yeah. Other questions from the room? Question up here? Yes. Thank you, Bill. Quick one. Will we see more archived projects in the future, or will it just keep growing? I'm going to tell you right now the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some processes that don't yet exist that we are currently trying to figure out how to pull off. Um, we have a lot of projects. 159 was the last count. Um, they are distributed across all forms of the life cycle, and the only thing that we are doing annual reviews on right now are sandbox. Um, we are very aware that as projects move through their lifespan, um, particularly when they get graduated, there are, no really, there are not a lot of checks and balances on how they're doing. They could be doing excellent, they could be doing amazing things, but we don't really know until we get a cube gun on which the graduated project updates. Um, however, in a lot of cases, they're not quite doing as well as we would hope. Um, we want to be able to reach back into the projects and understand what are their challenges, what are some of the successes that they're having and where we could potentially help them with their maturity? And the same thing applies for incubating projects. We need to be able to ask them those questions and also understand what indicators are going on with the projects where they might be too busy dealing with something that they can't reach out and ask for help. And that's for us to reach into the project and say, hey, what's going on? We saw this was happening. How can we help you? How can we get you all set up for success? And be a little bit more proactive instead of reactive because that takes up a lot more of our time. Yeah. So I uh, got a, a, a procedure specific question. So I still remember in the early, uh, really early days of the uh, um, uh, TOC, uh, back then we have the concept of six and working groups, like tech security was uh, first proposed as a safe working group, then safe uh, security C, then tech. Uh, I remember at, uh, at the time we positioned six as more like uh, eternal things and the working group as more ephemeral settings. I'm wondering if uh, the TOC is still considering like uh, the working group uh, set up now? Uh, because I, I, I talked with uh, Chris A back in March, uh, maybe we are thinking about propose a uh, LLM 
a large language model uh, 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 related uh, in CNCI because we are seeing like people are using uh, cloud native infrastructure, right, to to mm -hmm. uh, training and inference other things. So we think it might be a good idea to have a community effort in CNCI. And Chris says uh, back then says uh, maybe we can look at a working group proposal. So I'm asking mm -hmm. if the working group is still part of the procedure or tag is all we have now. Yeah. Um, so a while ago, we made some changes where working groups don't exist at the TOC level. Um, and the reason for that was is because we would be required to provide the oversight for them. And with all of the other things that we have, part of those working groups would probably be best served within a tag that's closer to that domain. But we understand that that model doesn't exactly fit. And that's kind of like the story of tag environmental sustainability. Um, we wanted to start them off as a working group. Uh, we didn't really have a good place for them to get started initially, so we tried something out. It didn't quite work as we intended. Uh, however, they are an, a new tag now. We do need to do a lot more in our processes of defining how do we take some of these exploratory concept areas in a technical domain and bring them up into a tag once they've fully fleshed out what that scope looks like, what their deliverables could potentially look like, whether or not there's projects within the landscape that they could potentially oversee, and I think that's a good case for one of them. Well, I can add an example of a recent working group, which is the Batch HPC, or the CNCF Batch working group. So this is very similar to the, to the description you, you have, which is to have a, a place where all the projects in this area can get together and even know each other better, mm -hmm. uh, to see where commonalities exist and how they could collaborate. Uh, this is a very good example, and it's been formed, I think, a couple of months ago. It's yep. Not, it's yep. The rock and roll. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And, and it's kicking off. Uh, we had the Batch HPC Day here where a lot of the people from that working group attended and a lot of discussion. And now they have a place to, to talk to, to talk to each other. It, they don't necessarily uh, report directly to the TOC, but they are very involved with the tag, in this case, tag management. So, yeah. uh, just wanted to be point like working groups are still very much a thing. So tag runtime session yesterday, uh, we discussed up about like spinning up two additional working groups. So there's already one proposal for a WASM working group. Uh, and then folks from like uh, a few other container OSs reached out, like they want a space to discuss more about container operating systems. So we're going to spin up one for that. And there was also one around ML ops that we said so we're going to do it. So there's definitely active uh, things going on. There's plenty of ways to be able to make this work. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Can I just add a very quick, quick thing yes, of course. on this? Okay. Um, I think the spin out of the working group from a process perspective is not the difficult thing or the challenging thing. I think uh, where the difficulty comes is to actually get enough momentum and people leading the effort. Um, and I think this is where yeah. we really need people to champion a lot of this. So for example, thank you for actually championing this working group or like the creation of this working group. And hopefully we're going to get more people to, to be part of this effort. So I think this is the, the challenging part, really. Um, we just need community members. We need interest and we need them to be uh, involved as much as possible. First, I want to thank uh, to organize this public meeting. It's very helpful, especially for myself. And this is Andy from AWS. I actually have two questions, very short, and one technical. Uh, one we, will we have the service tag. So the second question is how I can join the TLC. Uh, so I'm going to start with your second question, which was how do you join the TLC? Uh, we do have elections. Um, however, what has often worked well for the existing TOC members is being an active member and a contributing member to a project or to a tag or being somebody in the ecosystem that is doing things. A lot of what it is that we do is what I consider glue work. It's not glamorous, but it is the thing that needs to get done to enable our projects to be successful. So working within the community, taking on some of the uglier, like more challenging areas of work not necessarily always technical, is a good way for you to identify yourself within the ecosystem and put yourself forward as being interested in more and more of those leadership positions. And then those nominations are likely to follow. Yeah. 
I think, you know, starting from a tag, you contribute through a tag, that's a good way to start. Uh, and what was the first question again? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the first question is uh, one where we have the serverless tag. Oh, well, a serverless tag. Um, when a community member stands up and wants to be able to do it. There. Thank you. Yeah, back to my point. We need people to champion, <laughs> to champion these for experience and tags. Yeah, please do so. Yeah, nearly all of our tags came from people that were really involved in community and they, they came. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, I think that's a, that's a very good question. I think serverless is a, is a very good area, yeah, that we need people to start to form an active community, yeah, to drive this. And with that, we are at time. I want to be able to acknowledge all of these wonderful people for the work that they do, both now and in all of the meetings that we do. So thank you, thank you very, very much, and thank you to the audience for coming in today. It's been a pleasure.